welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. I've dedicated several episodes to the dynamics of prosperity, and we've covered a variety of different angles at looking at prosperity in your life. It is my goal on this podcast for you to manifest and create a reality in which you are absolutely prosperous, in which you are receiving the money that you need so that you can focus on other things and you can use your new resources to be of greater service. I want to talk about belief in this episode. All things are possible if you can believe in the prosperity that you wish to create in your life. Belief is a powerful method to change your reality. But how can we believe and what does it mean? All things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9.23 This is a tremendous promise with far-reaching implications. However, what does it mean to believe? Faith is not a constant. It means different things to different people. Certainly, it is a fundamental mind power that is basic to the realization of prosperity. But we need to get a clear awareness of the faith process and how to set it to work for us. When Jesus said to him that believeth, it is normally presumed that he meant to one who believes in God. The religion of many persons consists simply in a profession of I believe in God. Though they rarely bother to ask themselves what they mean by God, Sidney Harris, the syndicated columnist, said, My father didn't believe in God, but God believed in my father. Many of his readers took offense. He meant that his father was not religious in a creedal sense, but he believed in life. He was a good person who walked by faith and acted out of love. God is not a super person out there to whom we pray and from whom we beg favors. God is a life process by which we live. Emerson suggests that when you break with God of tradition and cease from the God of the intellect that God will fire you with the presence. There is no way that you can really begin to understand spiritual economics or to make it work in your life until you are free from the sense of God up there and on fire with the awareness of presence down here. God is not the grand man of the heavens, a great purser of accounts and disperser of divine substance. God is the transcendent whole of things which you are in an individualized part. The whole universe of innate substance is centered in you. There is nothing you can do to add to that or take away from it. And this centering, as far as God is concerned, is the same in all persons. That leads to the inescapable, thought-shocking conclusion that the universe was no more centered in Jesus than it is in you. Of course, that doesn't explain the quite obvious difference. Jesus, in his disciplined consciousness, was centered in the source, while we are usually centered in various levels of limitation. However, Jesus clearly said that you can do all that he did if you can believe, if you can center yourself in the creative flow as he was always so centered. This suggests an excellent definition for the word faith, consciousness, centered in the universal source. Religious teachings and teachers have conditioned us to think of faith as a magic catalyst that makes God work for us. In no way does faith make God work nor does it release some kind of miracle power. Faith simply tunes into and turns on the divine flow that has always been present. If you have a rheostat on your dining room light switch, or if you recall the dimming of the lights in a theater, you have a good example of how the divine flow works. When you turn the rheostat up, you get more light. When you turn it down, the power flowing through the bulb is reduced, which results in less light. There is no miracle involved when the room is suddenly flooded with light. The power is present all the time, whether the rheostat is high or low. A turned down rheostat is like consciousness of lack that restricts the flow of substance. The turned up rheostat is like a faith centering that opens the way to an experience of affluence. Perhaps this is an oversimplification, but it may help you to understand the principle 
and the process involved. Overzealous teachers and writers talk of the magic of believing and of the miracles of faith. It is understandable. They are excited about the role that faith plays in demonstrating prosperity. However, we must emphasize again, faith deals with the law, not caprice. Thinking of magic and miracles may mislead you into dealing with some fortuitous turning of the wheel of fortune. God's substance, God light, God's presence is always there. Creative resource that must flow forth when you create the conditions which make the result inevitable. Don't miss this vital insight. Faith is not a vague process of believing in something, much like a rote learned confession, I believe in God. It is rather a positive act of turning on something. The power is already within you. For you are the power being projected into visibility as you. You see, saying that you have faith in something, even faith in God out there, suggests reaching and supplicating, touching a magic button that does not relate to your wholeness at all. The ideal is not believing in, but believing from. You begin with the assumption of presence in which you live and have being. Your faith is an activity that goes forth from this base. It is a believing attitude that is made real and creative by reason of your attunement with the creative flow. The question may be asked, do you really believe that faith can change things? There is a changing process like light streaming into the room when you open the drapes. However, faith doesn't change the nature of reality any more than opening the drapes changes the nature of light. Faith tunes into reality and releases the imprisoned splendor. In pre-Columbian times, the people believed in a flat world, but the world was still round. Their belief in a flat world did not change the round world one bit. Later in the years following the discoveries of Columbus and Magellan, to believe in a round world did not require making changes in the flat world. Thus, there is a sense in which faith doesn't really change things at all. It changes the way you relate to them. There is always an all-sufficiency, even within the insufficiency. Your faith can relate to the whole or the partial, and it will be as you believe. When you pray for prosperity, your faith does not magically create bags of gold at your feet. This is not the way of divine law as we have learned it so far on this podcast. Actually, your faith has already been involved in your condition as with the turned down rheostat. You may have been believing in lack and thus you have experienced lack. As you re-enter your thought in the awareness of abundance, you turn up the rheostat, as it were, and become more synchronized with the process of eternal substance, which then flows forth in your experience in perfectly natural ways increases in salary higher investment returns and other improvements abundance is an ever-present reality this fundamental truth is the base on which all prosperity programs must build financial stringency of any kind is likened to the flat world it is where you are in consciousness but there is abundance for you right where you are even as there is a round world within the flat world. The one simply transcends the other. This is what transcendental means. We are not talking about two different worlds, but about two ways in which you perceive and lay hold of the one world, the world in which you have lack and unemployment and hardship and the world of ever-present limitless substance and prosperity. If you've been believing in darkness... The drapes are tightly closed and you have been experiencing darkness in your room. As you recenter your awareness in positive faith, you open the window to the light of truth. And it is as Isaiah suggests, Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be lifted up and shall be very high. Isaiah 52.13 Eric Butterworth says that the most widespread disease of our time may well be I can't itis. It is contracted by many of us early in life from our elders. Society has made a song of it that has neither rhyme nor reason, but it may be heard everywhere. I can't because I'm poor. I can't because I'm sick. I can't because I do not have the ability. I can't because I don't have the skill. I can't because there's no opportunity. I can't because I'm too old. I can't. I can't. I can't. How often are you saying I can't in relation 
to your prosperity. How often are you saying it, thinking it, acting upon your I can't? Few persons use more than a small part of the tremendous God power within them. You can alter the pattern of harping on the same old I can't tune. Actually, there can be no progress in the realization of prosperity until you do so. It calls for knowing, really knowing that you are a spiritual being living in a limitless spiritual universe, endowed with the whole potential energy flow of the universe. In most cases, the problem is faulty self-evaluation. For instance, you may say, I'm an average sort of person. This leads to the subconscious acceptance of the wisdom of the world, which proclaims the chances of success for the average person in this enterprise are about one in seven. But why be an average person? All the great achievements of history have been made by strong individuals who refuse to consult statistics or to listen to those who could prove convincingly that what they wanted to do and in fact ultimately did do was completely impossible. Let go of I can't and begin to identify yourself as God's living enterprise. You're not just an average person. You are you, a unique individualization of the universal creative process. Affirm for yourself, I can, because I am. Of course, you do live in the world of change, and you may well have occasional pressing needs. The insight of truth should not cause you to refuse to admit having them. The important thing is that a need has no built-in limitations. There are only limiting thoughts about it. If the Alps had looked as formidable to Napoleon as they did to his advisors, he would never have attempted crossing them in the midwinter. But he displayed the focus of his consciousness when he said, there shall be no Alps. He wasn't denying their existence, only their impassibility. He may say of some overwhelming difficulty, there is no way. And there may be no way to human sense. Again, all things are possible to God and to you in God consciousness. When you realize that you are one with God, that you are, are God, then all things are possible to you. The Napoleons of science and industry and space technology have faced the Alps of insurmountable obstacles by implying there shall be no Alps and so can you. Right where you are in your present level of development, there is a limitless resource of wisdom and guidance of ability and creativity and of substance and supply through which you can do and do superlatively well all that needs to be done. If you can't let go of limited self-identifications, if you can believe, the word develop is interesting in that it does not mean adding to or putting on something. It is related to the word envelope, which means to enclose. Thus develop means to unfold, developing a prosperity consciousness is not achieved by programming the mind with an array of pat statements of truth. You are rich, not because you decree it over and over again, but by reason of your spiritual inheritance and who you are. You are now as spiritual as you can ever be. You can't be any more spiritual than you are now. You may increase your awareness of your true nature, which will in turn increase your flow of substance and prosperity. You will not get prosperity out of this podcast or a book, this one or any other. Prosperity comes from consciousness, which unfolds from within. You'll be amazed at the wonderful things that will begin to unfold for you as you develop a more positive image of yourself and as you re-enter your faith in the all-accomplishing power of the divine process within you. Occasionally, a student of truth will say, I have worked so very long and hard to develop understanding. How long do I have to work at it until I arrive at the place where it just automatically works for me? The thought is so understandable, yet it's very naive. Ask the great athlete or the concert pianist or the successful actor if they have arrived at the place where they need no further practice. They will tell you that the higher you climb in proficiency and public acceptance, the greater the need for practice. You will note that even Jesus went regularly up into the mountains to pray, to practice the presence of God. There may be times when you say to yourself, but this problem is really beyond solution. 
After all, I am only human. What do they expect? But you're not only human. You are human, of course, but the human of you is a shell that encloses the divine of you. You can make your own personal breakthrough and release the tremendous possibility of your own divinity. This is the progressive unfoldment that you will experience as you diligently practice identifying yourself as a limitless expression of an unlimited universe. Do you find it conceivable that when Jesus began to experiment with the creative power of faith, he may at times have been challenged even beyond his capacity to believe? Would it shock you to consider the possibility that something within him, the last vestiges of human consciousness, might have said, you can't heal this blind man or provide a meal for this great throng of people? You wouldn't know how. If you've been conditioned with the idea that Jesus was very God, it may be hard for you to believe that early in life Jesus had the same basic difficulties of growing up as you did. Remember Paul said that he was tempted in all ways, such as we are. In other words, he achieved mastery by personal development and practice. Practice, practice. He said, in effect, I have overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Doesn't that clearly suggest that he had something to conquer, some personal growth to achieve? The great piano virtuoso Paderewski was once playing before an audience of the rich and the royal. After a brilliant performance, an elegant lady waxed ecstatic over the great artist. She said, Ah, oh, maestro, you are a genius. Paderewski tartly replied, Ah, yes, madame, but before I was a genius, I was a clod. What he was saying was that his present acclaim was not handed to him on a silver platter. He too was once a little boy laboriously practicing his scales, and even at his peak, behind every brilliant performance, there were countless hours of practice and preparation. A needy person once knelt down before Jesus, saying, Good master. Jesus cut in abruptly, saying, Why callest thou me good? None is good. Save one, that is God. Luke 8, 18, 18. He never seemed to lose sight of the fact that while people thought he was God become man, he knew he was man becoming God. We miss the whole meaning of Jesus' life unless we see it as a growth process and that before he achieved Christ's mastery, he was Jesus, the pensive lad who wandered and dreamed on the hillsides of Galilee. He did not say, I'm more divine than you are. What I do comes by divine dispensation, but for you it will take a miracle. He said, in effect, I have overcome the world by proving the power of faith and the inherent potential within man. If you believe in the creative flow of the universe as I have done, then you can do all that I have done, and greater things shall you do. The faith required to demonstrate prosperity is not simply a pious pronouncement. Eric Butterworth says again, faith is expectancy. You do not receive what you want. You do not receive what you pray for, not even what you say you have faith in. You will always receive what you actually expect. Sometimes, after people have experienced modest outworkings as a result of their prayer efforts, they may say, well, it is about what I expected. They may only be trying to cover their wounded egos, but they are telling much about their faith. How many people go through life in this consciousness, holding a tin cup under the Niagara of God's plenty, it is a small fry expectancy that usually manifests as a string saving, make do, can't afford it level of consciousness. It is marginal living at best. Some people even prepare for the worst so they will not be disappointed. And of course, they rarely are. What a weak and insipid kind of life expectancy. It is what we might call in tune with the indefinite. It is important to know that the creative process is at work in you all the time, not just when you are having faith. Infinite mind is an activity that is constantly at work within you all the time, not just when you're affirming healing or prosperity prayers. Sometimes people pray in tones that suggest trying to awaken God, urging God to get on the job, but it really works the other way. Awake thou that sleepest, Ephesians 5.14. It is you who are asleep to your God potential, which is always present. Unless you begin to understand God as principle, you will go on living marginally. The universal principle is before they call, I will answer, Isaiah 65, 24. In the great unity of all life, when you have a need, the answer is already moving on its way towards you. Before you formulate a desire in mind, it is God in you desiring. 
before you have an urge to do something or embark upon a project, there is a moving of spirit in you, prompting you in that direction. When you understand the cosmic origin of desire, the role of faith takes on a whole new meaning. It is not a matter of, gee, I wish I had enough faith to do this thing. If there is a need, there is an answer in infinite mind, and the need reveals that the answer is already on its way to you. Thus, faith is not an attempt to demonstrate the magic of picking yourself up by the bootstraps. Faith is your consent. It is saying yes to the outforming of the creative process. You may think that this is making faith is too simple. It is simple. There's nothing complicated about it. It deals with an inexorable force like turning on a light. It is simple, but it is not easy. There is a discipline of consciousness required and the commitment to practice the presence constantly. Yet the truth is, faith is saying yes. The exciting message of truth is you can have all you desire. It is a concept that raises a lot of false expectations and gives rise to many objections. You may say, I certainly have desired many things that have not been realized, but we have not really listened to our desires because our consciousness is too often centered in sense appetites and covetous urges. A true desire is not to have, but to be. We are whole creatures in potential, and the true purpose of desire is to unfold that wholeness, to become what we can be. As Goethe says, desire is the presentiment of our inner abilities and the forerunner of our ultimate accomplishments. Ultimately, some new thought teachings of prosperity have been centered not in wholeness and spiritual well-being, but in the crassest kind of materiality. The all things are possible promise is met with the covetous gleam of dollar signs in the eyes. Techniques are offered by which to treat work the principles for the high power job, the luxurious country home, the expensive foreign car, just treat for it and you'll get it. I have said the same things in my podcast. I'm just as guilty for saying it and teaching it. One woman said recently, God wants me to wear a sable. After all, I'm the child of a king. It is a common materialistic rationalization. The fact is God does not want you to wear sable. God wants you to be stable. The impetuous thing-oriented desire for sable may come from a sense of personal inadequacy, a lack of spiritual stability. The creative process seeks to express in you as a stable, well-balanced, prosperous person, but prosperity, you see, is a spiritual well-being. In a recent interview I had with Paul Selig, he explained it well. If you want to have the house on the hill because you see what other people have and you're jealous then you don't want it for the right reasons. But if you want that house on the hill because it's comfortable and nice, then that's fine. This is not to say that you cannot have fine things, for you can and you should. When you have a balanced consciousness centered in the ever-present light of God, the things will come easily as they are needed. It is a matter of priorities. Seek first his kingdom, Matthew 6.33. In other words, the first step should not be to treat for things that you want, but to get centered in the divine flow. I had to learn this the hard way. God knows nothing of cars or jobs or fur coats or country homes. God is light. God is love. God is substance. And this substance, this light that's all around us, will flow forth in your life in keeping with your consciousness of wholeness. The danger in constantly working to demonstrate things which the naive student of metaphysics is inclined to do like me, is that one tends to become an economic hypochondriac. There's always something more to demonstrate. The magazines and catalogs are full of alluring pictures that wet one's covetous feelings, how easily one's life can become dominated by things. The work to get them, the effort to care for them, the need to buy insurance to protect them, on and on it goes. And there's always something more to yearn for. After all, this is what prosperity is supposed to mean. Or is it? Students love to talk about all the manifestations or demonstrations of prosperity that they have made. Yet there is a sadness about it, for there is an implied emptiness and the frantic attempt to fill it. So the person makes innumerable demonstrations of prosperity, 
and yet never finds prosperity never experiences wholeness in spirit the mystic ideal so often missed is really very simple build on the awareness of the ever present light of god and expand your faith in the stability of your own inner wholeness the things will come too and in abundance they will come out of the expanse of your wholeness not at its expense Faith is really your consent to let your own uniqueness unfold and let that which is attracted by your uniqueness manifest in your life. Thus, when Jesus said all things are possible to them that believe, he did not say that a swan can become a duck or that a non-musical person can become a concert pianist or that I can become a quarterback. You cannot become something that is not the outforming of your inner potential. All things are possible. You can only be you. However, you can unfold more of you that may have been long frustrated. Many people are covetously influenced to seek to become like her or to have what he has. But if through mind dynamics you achieve that which is not the outforming of your uniqueness, you may lose even if you win. As with the problem in transplant surgery where rejection syndrome prevents the tissue from taking hold, So you're unable to hold on to or fully experience that which has not come out of your own pattern. It's like the reality rejects this new transplant that you've added into your reality. The important thing is to know yourself, to have faith in the cosmic process that will unfold in you like the life force unfolds in the lily of the field, which toils not nor spins. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Matthew 6, 29. Now having said all this, let us reemphasize the truth that you can grow, you can improve, you can be prosperous, you can succeed if you can believe. When you say yes to the creative flow within you, you begin to experience I am positive, I can attitudes which turn on the power and skills needed to accomplish This is the way the creative process in the individual works. On the other hand, disbelief is a negative power that frustrates or turns off your inner potential. If you doubt something enough, the mind will attract all kinds of reasons to support the disbelief. If you're constantly seemingly walking in a state where it's hard for you to believe in anything that I'm teaching or anything about the world or metaphysics, then you're constantly attracting things to show your lack of belief. It's all a reflection of your belief. In his classic work, Wind, Sand, and Stars, St. Exupery tells the story of a pilot who was downed in the rugged snow-blocked region of the Andes. He trudged through the snow for days, only to find his way hopelessly blocked by a yawning crevice in the ice. He quickly concluded that he had three choices. One, to give up and die of exposure. Two, make an attempt to jump across the fissure, knowing full well that it was impossible to do so, or three, convince himself that he could jump across and make an attempt out of that conviction. When considered in this kind of logic, the choice was clear, so he backed away a few yards, closed his eyes in a moment of inner communion, and then loudly shouting, I can, I can, he ran and jumped and barely reached safety on the other side. Trudging off down the mountain, he was finally found and saved. Now, faith was no magic bridge. There was no miracle of God picking him up in the air and depositing him bodily on the other side. What the man did was accomplished with his own concentrated mind and by special effort, by his own muscles. But his believing attitude released a flow of energy from his own inner God potential. There are many stories of seemingly superhuman feats accomplished under emotional stress. We are all too ready to call them miracles. How much more in keeping with the ideal of divinity of man to know that it is simply a matter of opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape. And as Jesus promised, greater works than these will you do, if you can believe. You may survey your situation today as concerning your financial needs or your job situation obsessed with problems of inflation, high interest rates, 
or the threat of a crippling depression. You may be totally discouraged, or you may carry on half-heartedly in the thought that, what are you going to do? It's just the way things are. There's much that you can do. You need not live marginally. You can achieve prosperity if you can believe in the allness of God, that you are not separate from God, that you are God. And everything that you see is a substance ever-present and all-sufficient And that is you, abundantly able to meet any and every need in your life. Your potential to harness the flow of the universe is the very law of your being. Even as the flick of a switch turns on the light by reason of the law of electricity, so your faith releases your success power by reason of the law of spirit within you. We're not talking about miracles here. No miracles are required. It is the way you have been created. You are a rich and creative spiritual being. You will never be less than this. You may frustrate your potential. You may have things that come up that make you think that you're not prosperous. You may identify with that which is less than what you can be. But right now, within you, and always, is the unborn possibility of a limitless experience of inner stability and outer treasure and yours is the privilege of giving birth to it and you will if you can believe you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com check out my art at newearth.art powerful fourth density technologies images designed to magnetize and broadcast Available at newearth.art. Be sure to sign up for our Large Sums of Money Reality Con 3 conference coming up on November 18th through the 20th. I would love it if you signed up for that event because it will give me a chance to go into you specifically to find out what is going on in your life and find ways that we can transform your life into one with large sums of money that are flowing to you easily and quickly. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.